possible for someone to be a stoic, but also to be emotional, like with someone that they trust. So I understand, you know, stoicism is about maintaining composure and not letting your emotions get away from you. But can one be a stoic and also be emotional at times? Can one be stoic and at the same time be emotional? It's like asking, can one be a politician and be honest at the same time? You know, because Stoicism has a history, we can't really talk about Stoicism without considering the history. When you speak about emotions, that too has a history, and you can't really talk about your question without approaching the history. And then both Stoicism and emotions really have to do with the complexity of being a human being, and human being, because he's a social or she is a social creature and lives in society, we can't really talk about stoicism without talking about society. And because society contains advertisements of sorts, we can't really talk about some of the social components. And when you talk about society, you have to talk about the culture, tradition, the rituals that live inside society. Uh, and you also have to consider that there are certain emotions that are good to have, there are certain emotions that are bad to have. You don't all of a sudden become a stoic. You know, you go through these chaotic moments of possessing intense emotions and they kind of just render you exhausted. And then you get to a place in life where you say, I just don't want to feel like this anymore. Imagine, uh, you seem like a relatively decent chap, uh, that you were to go out with a young woman. Uh, if, for example, your orientation is hetero, and tragically enough for you, you happen to be going out with a woman who is emotionally unbalanced. Whether it's chemical, whether it's historical, that's for you to kind of figure out, okay? Now initially, of course, it kind of creates for a very interesting and exotic environment because you have no idea what you're going to be confronting when you get home. It could be good, it could be bad. If it's good, you guys will go and have Zachary's. If it's bad, you play the role of a messiah, where you'll take her out for a walk, you'll sit her down and give her some wisdom. All the things you learn in your philosophy class. Then there comes a point where you realize that you've spent enough of your time, your energy, your resources, taking care of your woman, and now you have nothing left for yourself. Uh, <clears throat> It used to be fun for you, exciting for you, but because she's kind of taking everything away from you, uh, it's no longer as fun. And so once the fun goes away, you're left with resentment, and resentment, if unchecked, it will turn into anger, and then the relationship will kind of just go down from that point on. So, When you look at the world, for example, what exactly is it that you come to conclude about the world? It's always turning. There is no rest to it. It has no stability. It has no certainty. You know, you're walking, and all of a sudden, there's an earthquake. Um, on Thursday, the temperature is 90 degrees. On Friday, it's like below 5, you know. You have no idea what to trust. And so you kind of say to yourself after a while that if there is no certainty in this world, 
in physical life. And that physical life has a tendency of creating all sorts of emotions. You love your grandmother. Tomorrow you wake up, there's a message on your phone, Grandma passed. What? I just talked to her yesterday. You know, you write an essay, you think it's really, really good, you get your grade back and it's an F. You just leave your backpack to go use the restroom, you come out, it's stolen. You leave your car somewhere, you come back to it, and the windshield windows are broken. And you say, well, if the world has the power to create all these conflicting emotions inside me, you fall in love and you fall out of love. You wake up in a good mood, 10 minutes later you're in an awful mood. And you say, well, how do I walk away from all these emotions? I don't want to be like the physical world, always, you know, turning around and have no stability. And so you say, maybe the best thing to do is just to be detached, because that's what it is. You can't simply be detached from your emotions. You have to be detached from the creator of emotions. Some of it has to do with your companions, some of it has to do with your children, some of it has to do with just the workings of life itself, and some of it has to do with the fact that you have imagination. And imaginations create emotions. You know, you put a bid on a house, and you're hopeful, and you're excited. The realtor calls you 10 minutes later saying, I'm sorry, I didn't go through. You know? And then you sit back and you ask, well, you know, it's just wearing me out. You know, not only do I have to deal with the complexities of just myself being a human being, as Freud would say, you have an id that's chaotic, you have a super ego that tries to discipline you, and you have this poor ego that doesn't know whether it should go towards the ego, I mean, towards the id or the super ego, you know. And then you have problems coming from your companions. Then you have problems coming from your parents. Then you have problems coming from your boss. Then you have problems coming from your girlfriend. Then you have problems coming from, you know, all the fears that society creates inside you. And it's really, really exhausting. At some point you say, what the hell am I going to do? And there is another way, which is you can very much participate in the daily activities every single day whatever comes you know to you you can be fully engaged but you can kind of be uninterested in its conclusion or outcome you ask your question and let's say you ask your question because over the weekend you were reading something or you were listening to an audio, or maybe you and your father were sitting down and you were talking about stoicism because he enjoys that particular subject, okay? And then you say, well, let me, and you know, you guys were having a great time over the weekend, and you say to yourself, maybe I should go to class and ask this question from the guy who's up there standing all the time, okay? Now, <clears throat> it may be that I don't know anything about stoicism, and it may be because you ask a question for me and because I'm, you know, I have a 60 and have a few degrees, but can't really confess that I have never read Stoicism and don't know much about it. The best I can do is just ramble on, uh, creating a maya or an illusion that I know what I'm talking about and in fact I don't. And then you, it kind of frustrates you as I keep rambling on and you're listening to me rambling on because you're not getting the answer. Now, a good Stoic, someone who's really seasoned, and you can't, I mean, you really need to have been out there in life, having gotten your hands dirty for a long, long time to come to realize that life as is lived, it's just not worth it. You know, it's kind of like, uh, if I was to kind of give you Stoicism in a practical way, it would be like a woman who goes out with a man and she finds him very compatible, very exciting, very attractive. But she does notice that on her first date, on their first date, he drank three beers. But she's, ah, he just, you know, he's okay. And then as he becomes more comfortable, Three turns into four and then five. And then once in a while, he kind of just acts a little crazy. But by then, you have become emotionally attached a little bit. 
you guys have been talking on the phone for three, four hours, and you've gone out and, you know, dinners, um, and you've been hanging out for about four, five, six months, for example. It's very difficult to walk away because we are emotional animals. We get attached to things very, very easily. There is a stray cat that comes to the backyard, and on a daily basis, and I'm usually very exhausted, you know, I look at the cat, and the poor cat is a little skinny, and I, I think I shared with you, I went to Walmart a few weeks ago, and as I was just walking around, I wrongly saw myself in the, you know, animal aisle where there is all this food, so I bought like 50 pounds of cat food. And so as I'm walking to bed and I'm saying to myself, Amir, you have the power to go into the garage with a plate, pour some cat food into this plate, leave it outside for the cat to eat, or you can just go to sleep. You have the power to give food to the cat. If you don't, it's an act of cruelty on your part. Do not give in to sloth. Compassion, empathy, it doesn't need to be human being. It's a cat, but it feels. It feels the pangs of hunger, you see. I'm not in a relationship with a cat, man. But because I know I have power over the cat, because I know I have food, it makes me feel guilty not to walk into the garage, get some food, and just give it to the cat. I mean, that's the sort of animals that we are. You know, so when you kind of go on YouTube where these teachers tell you, well, be detached, it's really quite ridiculous. You can be detached because that's not who and what we are. Now, on good days, the woman asks this man, do you want to get married? Or worse yet, she misses her cycle, and she comes to realize she's pregnant. And then she goes and says, listen, I'm pregnant, we need health insurance, you have a job, you need to get married so you can be on your you know, benefits. Now, put the pregnancy aside because that makes things very, very complicated with the presence of a child. So what you have is this woman being intensely attached to this man. Now, consider the position of a man. You know, he probably didn't have a father, let's just say. Let's create a really exotic scenario. And he has a job he doesn't like. And none of us enjoy what we do for a living. So he goes, works eight hours, comes home exhausted, angry. You know, he wants to fly. He is, let's just say, an artist of sorts. And he doesn't really want to be mean to you, you know, but what else can he do? You're the closest person to him, and he treats you like a, you know, punching bag. And most of us do. We are usually mean to the closest people around us. Um, and you know, you like him, you want to be with him. So you sit down and say, honey, don't drink as much. And you say all those things because you're hopeful. You know, because you're both young. Because you believe in self-help books. You know. And you do this over and over and over again. Now remember, every time you come home, you have no idea if he's going to slap you, verbally abuse you, or just be cold to you. Uh, or he may just kind of, you know, be one of those depressing alcoholics where he drinks and he just goes inward and just shuts down. You have no idea. But either way, he just abuses it in some shape or form. But you keep trying to work through this mess. And your mother once in a while comes over, you go to your mom, and she says, honey, you look exhausted, is everything okay? I mean, exhaustion is just reeking off of you, you see. And your mom keeps telling you, why do you keep doing this to yourself? One day you're good, 10 days you're bad. You're depressed, you're sad. I don't like seeing you this way. You used to be happy, you used to laugh all the time. And then, you know, no one knows when your timetable is. In other words, no one knows when you're going to sober up and say, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to live with the emotion of uncertainty, fear, exhaustion. So you pack up your stuff, and it, these are steps that you have to go through. It's really, really tough. I mean, you can't just read Marcus Aurelius 
or Epictetus and say, these are great Stoics, and because I've read the meditations, uh, <clears throat> because I have read the shortness of life by Epictetus or Seneca, uh, I am now going to practice Stoicism. It doesn't really work that way. Like anything else in life, you're addicted to your physical life, you're addicted to all the chaotic emotions that your physical life creates, and now you say, I no longer want to get drunk by the influences of my physical life and my memories that create emotions. I want to live a sober life, which means I want to be reflective, I want to be in the hands of my mind as opposed to my emotions. That every time my emotions are about to erupt, my Messiah, the intellect, will come down and say, Toby, emotions are passing. Toby, what goes up must always come down, and what's down will always go up. Never give yourself to down, and never give yourself to up. Always approach life in the happy medium, the middle ground. Hello, Bridget. Okay. You know, it's kind of like, um, there's a story of this really, really great Chinese teacher whose name was something that I have forgotten. His name was Chong Su. And his wife apparently had died. And so his disciples decided to go to him to pay you know, their respect. And they walk into his house and he's like playing the drums and he's singing. And they are puzzled. They say to him, Chong Su, your wife, she served you for like 90 years. How could you like be happy. And he says, life gives birth, and life also takes away that which it gave birth to. If I was to be sad, what I'm saying is I'm going to go against life, and no one can do that. I have no power over life. Okay? Life creates, and life destroys. That is the function of life. Okay. I'm neither going to be sad, nor am I going to be happy. It's a really, really difficult place to be. So you're going to have many, many relapses, like any person who is an alcoholic or drug addict, because you want to sober up. It's just very, very difficult, very, very difficult, you know? I think what is positive in your case is the following. First, you're not like me. See, I am 60. If I was to all of a sudden say to myself, I am really interested in the works of Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, Epictetus, um, and there is something you need to know about kind of Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus, and that's it's the following. Marcus Aurelius is an emperor. He's a king. Epictetus is a slave. And the equalizer is philosophy. That whether you are a king or a slave, if you approach philosophy in the right way, the king and the slave will both stand on the same platform. They are equal. You know, for the longest time, we used to say, we are all equal in the sight of God. Okay? When it comes to Stoicism and Stoic philosophy, what they say, everybody is equal before the sight of philosophy. Because what philosophy encourages everyone is be sober, be reflective, don't give yourself to emotions. Now, before you actually walk the path of Stoicism, you are an emotional drunk until a point that is reached by you, which is, I am tired of being emotional, okay? <clears throat> so there comes a point where this, uh, uh, there comes a point where uh, the woman packs and she says, I want to leave. I know it's a little scattered, but I'll come back to you in just a moment. 
the husband or the man says, please don't, I made a mistake, I'm sorry. The woman all of a sudden has inspired in her the emotion of pity, affection, compassion, forgiveness. And this must happen over and over and over again. She has to be profoundly abused. Where she gets to a point of complete exhaustion. And then she says, I don't want to do this anymore. One of the best movies about this was, I think it's called The Burning Bed by Farrah Fawcett. It came out in the 80s. She ran into a guy, she liked the guy, she wanted to have sex with her, but he said no. Um, traditional, they need to get married, they get married, they have children, he gets drunk, he abuses her, over and over again. And many, many years later, she just can't do this anymore. Uh, when she sleeps, she pour, pours gasoline, you know, in the apartment, on the bed, she lights it, and she leaves. And then she's caught, or maybe she calls the police, she's tried, and she's found not guilty, okay? So, again, in my case, because I'm a 60-year-old man, I have 60 years of experience. I have 60 years of memories. I have 60 years of attachments. I mean, these are all emotional baggages that I am carrying. You, on the other hand, you're only 19. Now, I have 60 years of relatively mediocre experiences. There are no traumas in my life. Most of my emotions, let's just say, they're not bad, they're not great, they're mediocre. You, on the other hand, if you have trauma, you have to work twice as hard. I may be 60, but emotionally, trauma wears you out. It makes you like a few centuries old, okay? If you were to kind of walk the path of stoicism, you only have about 19 years to work through, as opposed to me having to work through for 60 years. That's a lot, okay? So what's going to happen to you is... You're young, which means that being young, you have a lot of passion. You have lots of dreams. You are ambitious simply because you are young. And in, in the anatomy, in the physical body of Matthew, ambitiousness, you have all sorts of emotions. You have fears. You have hopes. You have dreads. You have anxiety. You have frustration. You have envy. People who are your age are doing what you're doing. So you have to kind of be patient. You have to wait another few years to get to a place where your 19-year-old friend is already there. So you have all these emotions that you have to work through. Uh, and then you have to kind of stand and fall, stand and fall, be abused repeatedly until you say, I don't think I want to do this anymore. I'm just gonna go into the activities but expect nothing. If things work out, fine. If they don't, fine. It's, uh, it's a thing that we have in this... Uh, there's a tradition called Islam, okay? There is this tiny branch that comes out of Islam. It's called Sufism. It's like Christianity. And then there are the Christian Desert Fathers. These are people who are really interested in the spirit of the religion. You know, some people are okay with sitting back and just looking at the fire and taking notes about the fire, like people going to church and just listening and taking notes and walking out and just being their old self again. Some people want to be consumed by the teaching. They want to be touched and burnt by them, okay? So they have this uh, step, it's called Khalat Dar Anjuman. that you are in the middle of the hustle and bustle of life. But you walk in it in a profoundly detached way. Okay? Let me give you an example. Imagine you go to a party and there are 50 very attractive young women and there are 20 very attractive young men, one of them being you. Now, you happen to have studied, not just say philosophy, you happen to be very reflective. You take notes, you observe, you take mental notes on everything. So as you enter this gathering and all these attractive women are there, you realize that one by one they're approaching you and they're giving you the green light that here's my phone number, give me a call, we can go out, 
we can have coffee, and then they can go to my house. Okay? And you know what the outcome is. You guys will have physical intimacy. Okay? Now, because you're a reflective human being, and remember, you're a physical animal, which means that when you see something out there that's attractive, emotions are inspired. When emotions are inspired, what do you do? You want to touch what has given you inspiration. Okay? You want to touch it. You want to get close to it. That's who and what we are. Now, before you actually take few steps towards the object that has inspired emotions, you say to yourself, silently, of course, Toby, you have been here before. Toby, it is true that you're 20, but you're a very mature 20-year-old. Remember what happens. There is someone out there who's attractive. You go towards them. You take down their number. You call them or you text them. You go out for coffee. Uh, they have some interesting stories. They listen to you. You listen to them. And as each of you are listening to one another, uh, the value, your value goes up, her value goes up, interest blossoms, excitement blossoms, passion blossoms, she takes you home or you take her home, you're in bed, and you have sex for two, three, four, five weeks, and then you get bored. And then you try to be political in the sense that you try to tell her a story that will once again liberate you from the bondage of this relationship. You want out. You say, my dog died, my grandmother died, my father is sick. I am going to go on this quest for self-knowledge. I am busy with school. I just got my second job so I can hang out with you. So you know exactly how this is going to start. You know how this is going to end. So before you allow these emotions blossom to the point of all consuming, you become stoic. You say no. You know, it's kind of like the movie The Matrix. I don't know if, you're, if you've seen the first one, or even the second one, where near the end the bullets are going towards him. Now when bullets are going towards you, what's going to happen to you? I'm going to die. Oh my God. You run. You hide. You bend. He's stoic. He knows that mentally he has the power okay, to kind of change the physical scenario. He kind of goes like this and he says no. And all, the, all of a sudden, the bullets stop mid-air and they begin to fall. And that's what a stoic is. You know that physical components have no reality. You, in fact, have the power to stop emotions before they blossom and contaminate your interior, okay? All of us do it from time to time. You walk home, you realize your companion is in a bad mood. And you know that bad mood is like flu, that if you stay there, it will contaminate you. It will infect you. So you say, I'm going to go for a walk. I'll call you. If you're better, we'll go out for dinner. If not, I'll just go to in and out by myself. And what you're basically saying is, I see you, I see how you're feeling. The truth is, I don't want to be turned upside down right now. I, I'm okay with being the way I am. I don't want to play the Messiah. You may be my, my companion, but right now I want to exercise my autonomy, okay? You may be confused, I don't want to suffer your confusion. You may be in a bad mood, I don't want you to put me in a bad mood. And so what you're saying is, I want dominion, I want autonomy, I want power over the way I want to feel in the next few minutes. Okay? Now, you can't really just get there overnight. It means that you've been in this bad relationship, abusive relationship, for many, many weeks or months or years, where you're just exhausted of being abused. Okay? You don't want to leave your person. You just want to, once in a while, leave the environment that's toxic that the person creates. That is what stoicism is, okay? Now, there are a couple of things you need to understand. Stoicism is like a cult, okay? You can't learn stoicism by going to Laney College. You can't learn stoicism by being around your father, your parents, your aunts and uncles. It doesn't work that way. Because all these people are contaminated by life. Okay? Your father worries about you. Your mother worries about you. And oftentimes when, they, when you do something wrong or when, you, when they see you doing something wrong, they get intensely emotional. Okay? And that clouds the way they speak to you. Okay? 
given the fact that young people don't really receive advice well. You have to go to a center where they detox you from being attached to your mom or to your dad, to your siblings, to your standing in school, to whether or not you get accepted to UC Chico, okay? Um, and you have to be there for many, many, many years. And then once you graduate, they say, okay, Toby, you can go back into life. I'll tell you a story. It's about two brothers. One is married with a few children and one lives in a cave. The guy who lives in a cave can do all these miraculous things, you know? Like Jesus Christ, he can produce, like, make water, uh, wine from water. He can multiply fish and bread and all that stuff. But he lives in a cave. He never comes to the sea. And one day, the brother who lives in the city says, let me go visit my brother. I haven't seen him for a while. And lo and behold, he goes there and he sees all these wonderful things that his brother is able to do like Jesus Christ. But you know, his brother is a wise man. When you live, when you have a family life and you're healthy emotionally and intellectually, you kind of make fun of people who live in caves to some extent. So he looks at his brother and says, I know you can do all these miraculous works, but here's the thing. Why don't you come tomorrow night for dinner? And here's my basket. I know it has a lot of holes in it. Okay? Why don't you put some water in this basket? Because what you're doing right now is that you pour water in the basket, you kind of say something over it, and water doesn't leak out. Do the same thing as you walk into my house. And the weather's fine, it's no problem. And as the walker is walking through the city, he comes across all these very, very attractive young women. And then he gets distracted. And he sees like water going out that hole and the water going out this hole. And by the time he reaches the brother's house, there is no water left. So you can be stoic in a cave where you're not tempted. Or you can be stoic in life where life tempts you. You go home, your mom is in a bad mood. You go home, your mom is in a bad mood because of your brother, and now you have two chores. You have to figure out what the hell is going on with your brother, and you have to figure out how to calm your mom. And since you can't do either, you all of a sudden suffer from frustration. Okay? It is much easier to live in a cave and be a stoic than to be in life and be stoic. Unless you are in life, I mean, you have to be in life, but completely detached. Or, and the only way you can be detached in life, Toby, you have to be extremely knowledgeable and insightful about the workings of life. Now, some of you may think that when I come to class, and sometimes when I get extremely ex excited and passionate, it's because of you. It's not. That's just the way I am. I like these ideas. I like to play and explore these ideas. I do it for myself. And then all of a sudden, I just go nuts. Not because of you. Now, I will never assume that when you leave this classroom, this stuff has stuck to you. And if it has, it's going to be stuck to you for a long, long time. It's not going to happen because I know how life works. I know how young people are because I was one of them. I really understand the social forces well. I also understand that philosophy goes against life. You want to be a good Christian. I mean, carrying your cross means you can carry life. All of us in this class resemble the rich young man. We enjoy following Christ in concept only, from a distance. Okay? Because when you follow something from a distance, you're not responsible. You can go to your friends and you say, yes, I am taking a philosophy class. They will never say, well, are you a philosopher? That's a 
different cross that you have to carry. The cross you're carrying right now is waking up at eight, showering, coming to class, sitting, pretending to pay attention, or maybe you're paying attention, but you're not responsible to retaining all the information, or even a little bit. And if you are, not for too long. That's not a cross you're carrying, you see. Because I know that philosophy goes against life, I don't expect, I have never, for an 18-year-old to walk in here and leave as a philosopher, no. So if, if you, for example, ask me, my girlfriend and I are having some issues, and I may use Seneca to give you some pointers, I may use Socrates, I may use the Gospels, but I will never, ever, ever expect that you're gonna go home and pack your stuff and leave your companion. Because I know that you may do pack your stuff. You may even want to walk out. But as you're reaching for the knob, they'll turn around and you say, honey, are you going to be okay? And then they'll break down, and then you'll go and pack your bags. That's how it is. Yeah. There have been moments where I walk to class, and I'm extremely passionate, and I feel that the ideas have put too much pressure on me. I call my brother, who is much more sober than I am, and I say, Iraj, can I retire now? And he says, Amir, you're 50. If you retire now, the government will pay you 225 a month. Can you survive on that? If you can, retire. If not, shut your mouth. And he said, Iraj, you're right. I'll just shut my mouth. <laughs> 